Chapter 4. Off. An 18-wheeler thundered by, sending up a dust cloud of burnt diesel and swirling smoke. They didn't even slow, Sawyer said, lowering his thumb. He looked down at the old leather bag at his side and through crude vent holes that had been rapidly cut late the previous evening. Inside, Robbie's eyes were closed. Snores emanated. The little doggy was sleeping. I'm glad this isn't bothering you, he remarked as he sat on the larger of the two tattered suitcases that his mom had given to him under protest, certain they would never be used. Please take them, she had begged, just in case. He grumbled, glancing down at his parents' old luggage, crestfallen that her recent tool embellishments had only further served to seal his fate. Mom, I haven't been accepted. Yet. That was her remark. Oh, God. She turned away with a wink, thankfully without mention of the three-letter word who sat tall, staring at the two while wagging his tail. After the bedroom door fell closed, Sawyer banished the bags, burying them under a mound of dirty clothing to make them disappear completely. The vanishing spell wasn't destined to live long, for the following afternoon kicked off jean shorts, which had dried from a day at the swimming hole and crisped in warm summer rays on the walk back home when flying across his room, only to land upon a certain set of suitcases, tool insignias and all. His laundry, now washed and neatly folded, was accompanied by a note. Please let me know if you'd like me to help you pack. Love you, kid. Your mom. It was delicate and perfect. Sawyer's own last-minute packing, late the night before, had come down to haphazardly shoveling stuff from his dresser into the old leather suitcases, which in turn he muscled, smashing to compact the contents, while cramming in stray stragglers before straining the stubborn clasps closed. The second bag, smaller and demure, deceptively posed at being the easier to secure, but proved nothing of the sort. After chucking in a final few, and perhaps a few too many items, Sawyer put his full weight into the chock-full thing, bouncing up and down with a knee jabbed into its ribbing while struggling not to fall over. Frustration amuck. Several times he was forced to peer over the sides, finding the stupid offender at long last, the bit of a dress shirt. Oh, of course. The damn collar had been mauled by the jaws of a zipper. Scolding himself for packing the dreaded thing, Sawyer tore starched white shards from the steely metal teeth while wishing the stupid Oxford gone and cursing its very existence. Finally, poking a bit of protruding underwear with a pinky, he tugged the stubborn pull, which relented tooth by tooth until the tab was home and the bag was closed. Sighing, he flopped on the bed, fingers throbbing, though thoroughly satisfied by the minor mission. Glad that was over, Sawyer rolled over to pet Robbie, who sat tall, staring out and thumping for more, before noticing what had caught his little one's attention. There was an entire closet yet to be considered. Shit, the boy blurted perhaps a bit too loud, for the dog rose an eye with the tilt of his head. Rob was right. If they were going to sneak out early the next morning, the last thing needed was to arouse suspicion. The last thing they wanted was to wake up the parents. In a blink, a sudden screech made Sawyer jump. A mocking horn shifted in pitch as a pickup chugged by. Without thinking, he shot up an arm, then extended a thumb. But the primer splotched jalopy showed no sign of slowing as the blaring faded down the road. Relenting, Sawyer lowered his head. Signs of autumn were beginning to appear. Leaves were falling, and though not any more, there had been a definite chill in the air. Perhaps it wouldn't have been the most inspired notion to embark on an extended journey in the cold bed of a rickety old truck. With the jalopy, hope, too, was fleeting. Another scan of the road confirmed it to be empty, even in the far distance, as he began to reconsider the undertaking, wondering if it had all been a huge mistake. Sawyer heard a snort, followed by melodious snores, which rumbled the bag at his leg. Robbie could always bring smiles, even sleeping. At least one of them was at ease. But he must have been crazy to think that they could hitchhike on their own so far, all that way. Who even hitchhiked anymore? He had to be breaking some laws. What was he even thinking? What are you thinking, Sawyer? That was his dad's uncharacteristic response upon naively affirming the intention to do the unthinkable. His mom, despite not saying much, clearly had her doubts too. 
Hitchhike? Who even hitchhikes? Would have been Cole's interjection. Thank God the helpful brother was never around. Have you thought this through? His father carried on as he stuttered for a response. The complicated truth was that he had, but didn't have a solid answer. Or maybe he hadn't. Weren't answers supposed to tell you everything? His didn't make sense, at least not to the rational mind, and certainly not to his dad's, mom's too. Sawyer didn't have to be told that his scholarship would only cover university-run dorms. He knew, he knew. So they were out of the question, at least as far as he was concerned. Still, he was plagued while considering the only other option, renting an apartment, which would place a huge financial burden on his folks. He understood the worry. They had been placed in a bind by the shackling loans from his big brother's education, or so he was reminded for like the millionth time ever. Well, maybe I could get a job, he mumbled. A job, his father scoffed. Who's going to hire you? Please, Mom begged her husband, who couldn't take it any more, and stomped off into the other room. Your father and I promised you boys an education, but please be reasonable. We didn't promise one for the dog was interjected down the hallway, in a way far too reminiscent of Cole for Sawyer's taste. At least the remark hadn't won his mom's overwhelming approval. She, too, had lowered her gaze. In the melee, Sawyer's eyes found Robbie's. He gently stroked tan fur while wading out the storm. This wasn't without grumbling, though, but at least the grumbles were quiet and to himself. Frankly, he hated the idea that he wasn't being reasonable, after all, he wasn't the one who whined like a baby about needing a car for college, a car that had somehow morphed into tooling around in a pricey European sports coupe. Or coupe, as Cole would say. That wasn't him, not at all. Sawyer began to lift a hand in protest, but then, like his mom, held his tongue. And he did listen, he really did, despite being shot looks from his father that spoke to the contrary. It may have seemed as though he were zoning out, while searching for words in preparation of a defense, but Sawyer's mouth had fallen open in a quiet desperation, and nothing more, though more than once. Finally, taking a cue from his mom's arguing style after her second or third gentle nudge, he bit his lip upon his dad's suggestion that Robbie would receive better care and attention at home. After all, there are the two of us, and the vet... He is here, and you'll have to leave him alone when you go to class, and the library, and to study groups, and out with girls. It was hard to disagree, but for some reason he knew they were wrong. And not just kinda, or maybe, but totally. One hundred percent. It was weird to think of his parents this way, or that his folks could be wrong, but they were. They just were. Sawyer hardened with an impulse to shoot that he had never been on a date, so that wouldn't be a factor either way, but then softened at the impotent rebuttal. Date, ha. Huh. He'd probably be a virgin forever. Then it was over. Had silence been taken as his way of submitting? It seemed as such, though it was also apparent that neither of his parents much enjoyed winning. Soundlessly, his dad turned to leave. Then so did mom, but not before hugging him and fixing his hair. I want to support you, dear, but think about it she said, taking in his eyes. Wouldn't you rather be free? Scratch, scratch, scratch. There was a familiar call. Recognizing immediately, Sawyer was on it. Sorry, bubs. It was Robbie, of course. He was awake. Want to take a pee-pee walk? Pee-pee walk? Let's take a pee-pee walk. Pee-pee walk. He sang in a high-pitched tone, reminiscent of his mom's sweet timber, while opening the makeshift case to let the little doggy out. For safety, Robbie always wore his harness. That was rather silly, though, and he knew it, for when they walked, it was always together, step for step, leash or not. As the excited little doggie sniffed around at unfamiliar terrain, wondering where to explore next, Sawyer knew it wouldn't be much of a walk. They were anchored by two overpacked suitcases and a formal destination. Suddenly, a horn blast from out of nowhere sent his heart aflutter and almost made him lose it he turned to face a white vehicle that came to an easy stop before them. Two steps ahead, Robbie hadn't been caught off guard. He used the baggage as stairs to climb to the very top of the larger suitcase where he came eye to eye with the driver. It was a girl. With evocative bouncy sandy blonde hair, she sat behind the wheel of a shiny new convertible looking out at them as the little one looked back. Oh, and yeah, she was stunning. Going to Tool? How can you tell? 
He shot unwittingly before realizing how clever the retort had been. Oh, I don't know. She flirted breezily, giving him undue credit for his Don Juan smoothness. Realizing, Sawyer's ears turned red as she glanced down at the large Tool University bumper stickers that his mom had used to adorn his hand-me-down luggage. It was her way of apologizing for not having the money to buy him a set of his very own. At least his Tool University t-shirt was new. Under it, he subtly flexed his pecs, hoping the girl who shimmered in the sun would notice. Nice, she said, eyes cast down, though not exactly at him. Thanks, he hesitated awkwardly. So cute, she cooed. Anyway, I'm Jana. Want a ride? Yeah, thanks, he exclaimed, charging ahead while reaching for a bag before being stopped flat. I was talking to the dog. She oozed like warm southern honey. They took to the highway with the convertible top down and open to the world. The sun was higher now, and it almost felt like summer again. No more was there a chill in the air, but instead, the swiftly moving car created a hot Caranuba-scented breeze, which Robbie, perched on Sawyer's lap, let wash over him with eyes half-closed and a nose pointed out the window. So, you're bringing him? she asked bluntly. With eyes fixed on the destination, it was hard to tell if she felt that she had touched a nerve, for she added, Not that he ain't adorable or anything like that. It's just that you don't really see this sort of thing. Amongst underclassmen, that is. Jana turned out to be an underclassman, too. She would be a sophomore that year, and was pretty certain she was going to declare herself a business major, only to return to the South Carolina she had known practically her entire life. I know it's kind of silly, too, and all kind of over the top? She spoke with the quick flash of a nervous smile and an endearing southern drawl that more and more found its way into the conversation as she relaxed around them. But then again, we have one of the best management programs. I mean, the best. And I mean, sure, I could have just stayed at home to help with the family business. Was born into it. Probably be the CEO one day. But then I got into two, and well, what the hell? What's wrong with seeing the world? Maybe even run her from New York. New York City? We could do a beeline and make a stopover. Oh? If there were time, that is. Ah. But yeah, I don't think so. Ever been, Sawyer? He shook his head. He couldn't say that he had. It's something. I bet. It really is, she said wistfully. They became quiet as the warming air bathed them with hints of wetness, and the modern motor gently rumbled their seats. Jana stared at the road with a far-off look that made him wonder what she was thinking. Maybe something, or maybe nothing. Still, Robbie was serene, so he tried to be too. Then, before Sawyer could find the right time to ask more about her travels or dreams and such things, she broke in, glowing about her perfect GPA and almost perfect high school boards. If not to go to a prestigious university like Toole, then what had I put in all that work for? He really couldn't say, so she did the answering for him. Just kidding. There's no place like Toole. So they tell me, he said innocently, but she took as overflowing with irony, which led to silence once more. With Robbie now snoring on his lap, to fill the silent spaces, she spoke about the only boy she had ever loved. Truly, truly loved. He still lives back home, but it's over. She didn't talk to him anymore and didn't much like thinking about him and was surprised he even came up. That was forever ago. Oh? Yeah, like maybe a year. Wow. Yeah, time makes one forget, she confided, though added how hard it had been to walk away from a relationship without so much as a goodbye, despite all of the begging. He begged me. A second wow was all that Sawyer could manage. I guess he got married, or is getting married, or something of the sort. He's a dirt farmer. He'll pretty much be a dirt farmer his entire life. I have a feeling. I have a feeling. She corrected herself. Sweet southern drawl suddenly stripped away, before adding that her cousin had ended up marrying one, only to become the black sheep of the entire family. Every family's got one, Sawyer heard himself saying, while wondering if that was him. Jana changed the subject by talking about their school, which felt strange, for he really didn't feel like it was his school, but maybe that was only because he'd never actually been. Trying to be optimistic, 
He rationalized that things would be different once they arrived, as she continued, interrupting unsettled thoughts by jovially filling him in on all of the parties and cliques and the social life he should expect. This, of course, was in addition to Toole's well-represented Greek system, which, she admitted, covering a twinge of regret as her face turned red, that she would be rushing this year, too. Rushing, he said obliviously. Stay away from the greens and you'll be dandy. The who? Yes, exactly, Jana affirmed with a dismissive nod. Then there were the profs, the many to be certain to take and the ones best avoided, and the fabulous student union, and all the places in town to eat. It went on and on and seemed wonderful, really, but as Robbie adjusted in his lap to get more comfortable, Sawyer couldn't help wonder when the unsettling phone call would come, the one from his parents. He sunk into his plush leather seat, which she informed could recline if he wanted, pressing a few buttons before he could find one. It looked strikingly new, like no one had ever sat in it before, yet felt broken in, cushy and comfortable. It has a vibrator. That's the back massage. Get some sleep. Won't bother me at all. And feel free to put your feet up. Kelty does all the time. Kelty? Don't be timid. As Sawyer settled in, he wondered what his folks could be thinking, if they were mad or in a panic or in the process of disowning him. Despite knowing his actions had been right and needed to be undertaken, the same couldn't have been said of the execution. To leave without explanation, without a goodbye kiss or even a note, that just wasn't him. Wooed by the return of her sweet country twang and Robbie's gentle snores, he closed his eyes. It all mixed with swirling thoughts in his head. Was it him? Maybe it was. It's you, she panted through thick southern sweetness, and he believed her. The faintly perfumed wind kissed his cheeks and tussled his hair. Fast. They were moving fast under a canopy of ancient timber, woke by crisp rays of warm sunlight that intermittently filtered through rustling leaves. It heated their skin as her hands found his chest and his legs her thighs, and the lone sick world went spinning. Against him, she pushed her weight against him. He wondered who was driving, and he wondered where Robbie was, but at the moment didn't care. This must be what death is like. Yes, sensual lips mouthed, begging for more, seducing with wisps of air that caressed the very tips of his ears and fluttered against the length of his long eyelashes. He inhaled, taking her in, the nape of her neck, the very shape of it was sublime, perfect, and how it felt being kissed, unearthly, like such a thing shouldn't exist, an impossibility, a divine proof of God. His eyes closed while following the gentle curve of her collarbone, hid by a breezy shirt with intentions to conceal, as if attending a tea party, as if they were playing childish games, but they weren't and he wanted it gone, whether by gently guiding the buttons undone or ripping the cursed thing off bare skin with ferocious fingers going in for the kill. And he was, and then it was, an undertone to her night-blooming perfume, the unique feminine scent of her armpits flooded pungent, as did wild dreams of what lay beneath. Brief glimpses of her breasts enticed him to follow. They led to the curve of her navel, over the small of her back, and along smooth sun-kissed legs, glistening in sweat, sweet with coconut butter. Lost amongst those, gliding meekly, yet strikingly powerful, armed with strange sensibilities, a capable ruler of armies, all the while lying, an omen portending not to be, to never have been, playing at being frail and innocent and weak, was her most secret of secrets. From below, hints of intimate treasure mingled between her legs and amongst all others, the silly lotions, the over-the-counter products, the pricey high-end perfumes, hiding under cover, lingering coquettish, calling out for him, so feminine yet desperate not to be seen. But he did. He saw. Sawyer caught fleeting glimpses. He inhaled her uniqueness teased by its sweet ephemeral nature and deep alluring tones. He was driven, driven down by unmistakable cues cascading through her thighs and around her hips, swirling over a firm belly and the soft curve of her breasts, 
where it met the boy to envelop him whole. Only then did he realize they were naked. She was on top, binding him into the seat, which wouldn't have been bad if he hadn't felt so anguished to explore and expose and revel in the mysteries of her inner thighs. Sawyer's mouth fell open, but was unable to speak. He was parched, some would say thirsty. His tongue stuck out, yearning for answers from her secret lips. On his leg, he felt the wetness through her panties. She was almost there, too. Through his jeans, her pubic bone grinded against him. It was hard, rock hard, and would have made him, too, if that hadn't been the case for ages. The throbbing. It was rhythmic. The quivering was, too. It undulated against his groin, and his rock-hard thing responded with a mind of its own, pulsating, pulsating back, throbbing, throbbing so that he was sure to lose it, like any second lose it. And the vibrator, the vibrations weren't helping, but oh God, the feeling, the fucking feeling, so fantastic, so much vibrating. Um, you gonna get that, dear? Yeah, he shot. Good dream. Jana beamed an impish smile while firmly gripping the steering wheel. We're almost there. Her right hand squeezed almost imperceptibly, but her eyes remained on the road. The little dog, who had apparently been awake for quite some time, turned back to look at him. Huh? he asked, dazed. Your phone. It vibrated in his lap. As the ringing stopped, he made a silent apology to Rob for the state he had found himself in, which he took immediate measures to cover adjusting in his seat under a shroud made of his hoodie. Thanks, Sawyer said, reading a message on his phone with an awkwardly placed arm that helped to obscure things. It's from Mom. They want to know if I've eaten. They sound sweet. They're not mad. Not many pitchhack the way into the Ivy League. He looked down at the screen, wondering what to say, but before he could type, his body lurched forward as Jana pointed. Look! she said, pulling off the interstate. We're here. Okay, where's your dorm? His lowered eyes found her tanned legs. They got lost in little untamed blonde hairs and made him yearn for the lazy naivete of summer. You mean you don't know? Jana asked, awestruck, interpreting things correctly. While entertaining wild thoughts that indeed they were destined to be lovers, fantasy led nonfiction as he followed her across the quad. At his side, the babe hidden in his makeshift case stirred, sensing the moment too. Climbing dormitory stairs, he could see little more than her white linen shorts, which were so short, like the most perfect short, and became rounded by her form in the most fantastic way. It was unbelievable, and they were actually going into her apartment. Looking hard, he was permitted the smallest hints of her lower orbs. They were wondrous and would peek out for brief instances, and he couldn't believe what he was seeing, and it was impossible to turn away. Behind the curve, a misstep had his big toe slamming into stone, also impossible, to muffle a gasp as Robbie cried. You okay? Ugh, he groaned, awkwardly, desperate to recover. Got it! So silly. She shook her head while opening the door. At that moment, he could tell it was over. Any magic was gone, and they were destined only to be friends. Still, Jana turned out to be a good friend, and told him they could stay in her dorm until Kelty, her quirky, boy-crazy roommate, arrived, which wouldn't be for a couple of days. As Jana retired for the evening, Sawyer made a silly ploy following her, but she stopped him cold and turned him by the shoulders with small, graceful hands that led him to the other door. Aside from a few polished stones, Kelty's bedroom was empty, He knelt at the desk, looking at them, then picked one up. She a geology major? There was no answer. Curled up in a little ball on the bed, Robbie had made himself comfortable too. I guess she's out, he said to the little dog, who returned his eyes with ones that slowly fell closed. Gently stroking tan fur, Sawyer joined him. He tried to sleep, but upon drifting off, his hand would fall away which would prompt determined thumps, and he would resume stroking the little doggy's chest. It was a new bed, so perhaps that was it, or perhaps his back felt stiff from the long car ride. Still, petting the babe was meditative. Fingers drew together, then slowly released, tussling little white cowlicks while moving more and more on their own, and soon the boy's head sunk into the plush pillow, with eyes heavy and drifting and falling closed. 
Shit! He woke with a start, sitting up rigidly while castigating himself. How long have I been out? Sawyer checked the time on his phone. Shit! He grabbed his bag, scrambling to the desk near the bed while taking out a safety razor and several medicine bottles. With haste, he sliced fragments from the already small pills, which were examined with rigorous precision, at times adding or removing tiny bits that powdered to sand. Oh my, rang a voice. It was Jana. She stood over him. I'm not a drug dealer, I promise. As if I could ever think that about someone like you. Waiting to eat, Robbie looked up at her. You didn't notice my sundress, she said later as they walked. It was yellow and accentuated her sun-kissed skin gloriously. As she moved, it would float over her nude legs and every so often against his. They were shiny and fragranced. While he was sleeping, she had shaved, Jana casually reported, which gave him the tingles. In addition to her dress, he liked the fresh scent of her new perfume, though he wasn't about to mention it, thinking that would be too much. And, despite having said that they were only friends, she took his free hand, the one that wasn't attached to Robbie's leash in her own as they walked. Despite repeated wiping, it remained clammy as the little dog pulled ahead, sniffing at everything and peeing pretty much everywhere. Jenna showed them her town, as she called it, which made Sawyer smile. Still, the campus was beautiful, old and majestic. The cemetery they walked through, if not ancient, was historic, with gravestones and crypts dating back hundreds of years. Most magnificent of all were her legs under the yellow dress, which flowed back and forth breezily with hinted promises of translucence bestowed by the kind late afternoon sun. He would peek over every so often while looking down to check on Robbie, trying not to be creepy. You hungry? She asked, interrupting his creepy thoughts. Let's go down State Street. On the way, you can tell me about life as a drug dealer. As she led, he told her about phenobarbital that Robbie had been on for years and was for seizures, but how furosemide, which was new, was supposed to help him breathe better, while benazapril was for blood pressure. Then there was vetmedin, which, prescribed by the cardiac vet, he wasn't so sure about. It was one of the things he intended to check. Research? Yeah, something like that. We have quite the impressive research facilities. Maybe the best in the world, she said, pointing to the medical library. The best. Your med school's been ranked number one for the last three consecutive years. Oh, are you pre-med? Oh, I don't know, he said after an uncomfortable pause. What he have, anyway? Some kind of thing, he answered obtusely, purposely playing on his youth. At his leg, Robbie had stopped and looked up. One sec, he wants to be picked up. Sawyer reached down and cupped his left hand below his doggy's torso, and Robbie gently tipped over, surrendering his body, falling into the hand that picked him up and held him tight to his daddy's chest. Wow, you two are amazing. We're like peas and carrots, he said, echoing southern honey while bravely grabbing her hand. Food? Food, she smiled, swinging his arm in agreement as they set off, but then abruptly stopped cold. Oh, my. What? Tyler, she announced breathlessly, dropping his hand. Who? he asked, mourning the loss of her touch. Sawyer glanced over and saw where she gawked more than was looking. Down the street, a car skidded to a stop, then an amorphous blob got out. Tyler, it must have been by the way she gasped. He clashed unapologetically with his sleek white beamer, which, too, seemed out of place on the quaint Old World State Street. After nodding as if he had done the impossible and tamed a wild beast, the vehicle responded with a clink, and its gull-wing door closed, emanating a mechanical drone. Then, soundless seconds later, as if the car were done watching him waddle away, the headlights turned off as well. Jana nodded as Tyler passed, but he barely returned the favor. That's it? A stunned Sawyer asked. He's an upperclassman, she looked gawking before becoming breathless over the magnificence. To Sawyer, though, he might as well have been picking his nose. Excuse me, he said while taking a tissue out of his pocket. The precious little picked up about Tyler had already grossed him out far more than picking up poop. Surely Robbie, with his impeccable timing, felt the same way, too. After they ate, Jana took him by the dorms and pointed at the one she thought would be his, but then was shocked to learn he hadn't pre-enrolled. I haven't given it much thought, he stated flatly. 
It was the absolute truth. What? Classes? Yeah, you know. No? Like the carefree casualness of his opening line, Sawyer had been sure this would go over well, but that couldn't have been further from the truth. She went on to warn that in her expert opinion, he may not get into any of his classes whatsoever, and that it would behoove him to check right away, stopping them in the middle of the quad so he could proceed post-haste. The honest truth was that Sawyer didn't even know what pre-enrollment was, or was even a thing. Not that he was about to mention it, especially considering the way she was looking at him, which wasn't good. Skeptical over her alarm, he covered his wry smirk, but then checked to find she hadn't been mistaken. I mean, why do I have to even take any? He found himself asking. Any what? Oh, oh, nothing, he said absentmindedly while glancing down at the list on his phone. She was right. All of the classes were full, most overflowing. You're kidding me, right? She stated, more serious than ever. History and business. You got in? Waitlisted. I'm on the waitlist for the waitlist for everything else. Oh. She sympathized with a groan, then pointed to a building across the street with instant cheer. Oh, I think that will be your dorm. Some of the overlords can be pretty atrocious, but your resident dean is Fergenstad. Lucky? Who? You'll have to watch out for him for sure. Who's your roommate? My roommate? You don't know? <laughs>